Merry Christmas Sunday. Great Sunday of the year, one of my favorites. If you uh, happen to be new or visiting with us this morning, I know we have a lot of people gone uh, traveling for the holidays, but we also have family that travel in for the holidays. So if this is your, your first time here, you just happen to be here for this week, we're really glad that you're here. Hope you enjoy yourself uh, today. My name's Dwayne. I'm one of the pastors here who serves under our head pastor, Jesus, and I'm one that, pre- one that preaches most of the time. We've been celebrating Christmas really all month uh, long this year in the season that we call Advent. Advent means uh, coming, and we think it's uh, pretty incredible, believe that God came into the world in Jesus, and so we like to make a big deal about it here. Uh, well, as a reminder, with this year, we've been having a giving theme uh, for Advent, and that's really been our theme as a church for the entire year. We, we see ourselves as a people who have been given much by a very generous God that then turns our hearts to be giving much. And so we've been encouraging you to, to give, to be a giving people, and we've been encouraging you to do that in four different uh, ways. One, in, in giving away your story, like the videos we've been having each week here uh, at The Resolve, like the one that we just watched, to be giving away our stories of of, of how generous God has been uh, toward us. The second one to uh, give through our resolve to love food ministry that you, you heard about at the beginning of the service. You can contact the, hit up the people at the info booth afterward if you want to be a part of that. Uh, third time in giving away your, your time by, by especially hanging out with people who may not yet be Christians as, as Jesus has come into the world uh, for our sakes that we would go into the world of other people's lives for, for their sake. And so maybe, maybe invite somebody over for Christmas dinner to spend time with you this Christmas as you share the joy of Jesus in your family. And then the fourth way that we've been encouraging uh, you to be a giving people was to be part of the, the auction fundraiser that we had uh, last week. And many of you were a part of that and just really uh, proud to announce that we were able to raise over $5,000 last week at that. So pretty cool. Uh, good job, church. Yeah, go ahead. That's, that's great. Uh, since the, uh, the auction is over, I've kind of got like a substitute fourth way that you can be giving, and uh, I, I've worked pretty hard this week, and our team did too, and kind of putting together some, some numbers and reports and the things that God has done in us as a church this year, and so we have a, a year-end report and, and kind of request, and so I encourage you to go read that. It's online on our website. We've kind of mass sent that out, so you can, you can give away a little bit of your time and read that just to hear uh, what God's doing. All right, so on with the sermon. This is the fourth and final week of Advent, the angel's candle of of peace. So our sermon title for today is Give Peace. And the main text I want us to look at this morning is John 14, verse 27. There's, There's four Gospels, which are accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus from his time of his birth to his resurrection. And this verse, uh, John 14, 27, it's not really a, a classic Christmas uh, text per se. It actually comes toward the end of, of the book, right near the end of, of Jesus' life. He's at this point, he's a full-grown man, and he's looking back on, on his life, and then he's, he's looking ahead as well, considering his future and what's about to happen. Um, and, and so that's kind of the context that we come in today. Now, we're going to talk about Jesus' birth, so don't worry about that. It'll just be from really the perspective on, on how Jesus viewed his own birth and his mission to bring peace. And that's really why I wanted to use this passage for today. So let's go ahead and and read it, and then I'll declare it as God's word, and we can pray over and ask God to work in us through it. Um, So here we go. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming and being born among us. We pray that as you have physically come into the world, that you would spiritually, that you would would come into this place, manifest your presence, that it would be felt and known among us, that you would come, that you would dwell and rule in our hearts and our lives. We need your peace. So would your peace come, we pray in your good name, Jesus. Amen. Peace. Peace. The, the most popular symbol in our culture for peace is the peace sign. You're probably familiar with, with that. Uh, 
Some of you might not know this, but it was actually born out of the post-World War II movement. Uh, it's the sign for nuclear disarmament. So uh, peace symbols, the, the semaphore letters D and N that are placed on, on top of one another. You can kind of see how that, that came about. Now, nowadays, it, uh, the peace sign, it seems to be more associated with like deadheads and you know, tie-dye and smoking ganja, uh, seemingly. But the need for peace and disarmament among countries across the world is, is as real as ever. There's still so much friction and fighting in so many places in our world. Um, the classical Christian symbol for peace is actually a dove with an olive branch. Uh, this is a symbol that early Christians actually were the ones that, that first started using it. This, this picture here is actually from a catacomb in, in Rome from about 500 AD. And, and really it's a sign that connects Jesus and the salvation that, that he brings. It looks backward to the time when there was the, the flood with, with Noah and God saved his people with a, a boat. And then they came, the boat came to rest with this, after the time when the dove came back with an olive branch. So in the same way, God saves us from his judgment by getting on board with Jesus, whom a dove also ascended on him at his baptism when Jesus was baptized in water right before he started his ministry. Peace. Peace. There's lots of ideas and lots of talk about peace in our world and In our land, but the truth is we actually experience very little peace. Uh, To get our minds around peace and the peace of Advent in our passage, John 14, there's just four things I want us to walk through uh, today. I'm going to look at Jesus' peace, world peace, your peace, and others' peace. So first with Jesus' peace. Uh, In our passage for today, Jesus here is is, is very specific. He is is giving peace and he, he says it's my peace. My peace. When I first started working with this passage and studying it earlier this week, I I wrote down on a little piece of paper, what what is Jesus' peace? What makes Jesus' peace different? What's what's special about Jesus' peace? It's my peace. Jesus here, he he seems to imply some pretty big things. Uh, The way that he singles out the peace that he's talking about as, as my peace. Seems to say that his, his peace is very different than, than other pieces that are out there. And it seems to talk about it as though this, this peace is something that, that belongs to him or is attached to his person, that, that he possesses this, this peace, my peace. If that's correct, then we need to understand what, what he means by that or why he would say such a thing. What's special about his peace? To get at that, we've got to go back and Time in the scriptures to look at the expectation of, of what, what the expectation was for Jesus coming and what it was like once he did come. So uh, I want us to look at this passage in Isaiah 9. Ryan used it as a part of our call to, to worship uh, from Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. Prophecy passage written about 700 years prior to Jesus coming. It's a prophecy passage about the Messiah, Savior, who is, is to come. So here it is. For to us a child is born, to us a son is is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So a couple of things in this passage. First, get this. One of the names of the Messiah, the Savior, is Prince of Peace. Why? Because as the mighty God, the mighty King, God of God, He would bring an everlasting peace. Peace with no end. There's both a, a quality and a quantity to this peace. So when Jesus says, my peace in John 14, 27, he surely would be thinking of this. He, he frequently identified himself as, as the fulfillment of the Messiah prophecy passes to come. Lots of times quoting from the book of Isaiah. He incites at the very beginning of his ministry when he, he comes to bring this gospel of peace. Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Then check this out. When Jesus was born, a little baby, uh, there was this angel that appeared to some shepherds that were in some, watching their flocks in the field at, at night and, 
And then when the angel appeared, it said this from Luke chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, well known Christmas passage. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you that you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And then suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among with whom he is pleased. A hmm. couple things. First, the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. It tells us something. Uh, have any of you held a, a little baby lately, like a brand new, fresh, you know, little baby? Just right out of the oven, right? Like, brand new baby. Now, how many moms out there do you think that if their, their fresh, brand new baby was, was crying, they would just kind of put him in the bassinet or, or whatever and, and just let him cry it out? Just let him cry. Just leave him crying. All right. No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. That's, that's mean and cruel. The baby's crying. You pick up the baby, right? You try to comfort the baby. But if the baby's not crying, the baby's at peace, right? So, I, I, I mean, this, must, this tells us Jesus, he, just, he must have been just at peace. He's all cozy, just chilling in the manger. He's happy. Happy, happy Jesus. Happy baby Jesus. Now, I don't know, maybe Jesus never cried as a baby because he's God and he didn't sin and all that. You know, you have to ask somebody smarter than me. But it, it's clear, this, he's, he's lying in the major wrapped in swaddling cloths. He's at peace. The Prince of Peace is born and he's peaceful. Now, that's just kind of a fun thing. But check out the second thing in this verse. It's a little bit more theological. Look at what the, this whole multitude of angels sing. We just sang it. Angels sing glory to God. Because they recognize that in Jesus' birth, peace has come. And he will give that peace to certain people whom he pleases. See that? Our, our, our passage, get this, in, in John 14 today, it's a direct fulfillment of the angel's announcement here. It's a fulfillment of it. In John 14, when Jesus is, is giving his, his peace to the disciples, he is acting as the Prince of Peace, who, who brought peace in himself, my peace to the earth, and then he is giving it out to those whom he pleases. He's giving his peace. Pretty cool. It's a direct fulfillment of what the angels sang. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, Jesus says. So peace, it comes from Jesus. The, the Prince of Peace and his peace has been given to us. That's Jesus' peace here. But there's a problem. Because in that we recognize that he is the source of peace, but it doesn't really tell us much about what this peace is. So let's move on to our second point and begin to talk about this in world peace by looking at what it isn't, and then we'll look at what it is in your peace and others' peace to see what that is. So first with world peace. World peace, it's been a sought-after ideology for hundreds and thousands of, of years, and, and people have sought to achieve it in all kinds of ways. At, at the time that this text that we're, we're looking at today, at the time it was written, uh, it was, peace was a very popular word among the people. It was used a lot. It was a common greeting. Instead of saying hello, you would say peace be with you. And instead of saying goodbye, you would say peace be with you. Constantly using the word peace. Uh, the Romans, who were the, the political and military rulers of, of Jesus' day, they were widely known for what's called the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Uh, the Pax Romana was supposed to guarantee safe passage, peaceful passage on Roman roads and cities and colonies. What it really meant was that Rome had achieved military supremacy. And so, so through force and through, through violence, anytime there would be any dissent or upheaval, they squashed it in the name of peace for the land. Uh, in our age, the world peace, it's become uh, really a slogan. There's all kinds of organizations out there for, uh, for peace, attempting to promote and achieve peace among the peoples of the world. There's International Peace Day, there's peace treaties, there's peace marathons, there's a university of peace, and even a world peace council. Peace, peace, peace. But despite all these efforts, there's still no peace. And, and this is not new, the efforts for peace failing. Listen to these words from Jeremiah. He's another prophet in the Bible written about 600 years or so before Jesus was born. Jeremiah says this in 
chapter 6, verse 13 and 14, from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain, and from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Peace, peace, but no peace. Peace, but no peace. Jesus' words in our text today, they're very clear. Jesus clearly distinguishes his peace from what he calls the peace of the world. So so look at it again. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. So so there is a peace that the world gives. Now, Jesus' peace is different. We've got to ask then, what is the kind of peace that the world gives? What's he talking about here? Now, in the Gospel of of John, in the writings of John, the world, that's kind of like a key phrase. There's a lot to that phrase, the world. It's a, it's a whole paradigm. The world is really, it's, it's the world apart from the rulership and the worship of God. So it, it's seeing the world and living in a world without having God in it. So when you read the world, you got to read like godless worldview. So when you read the world and you're reading John, think godless worldview. Now in the godless worldview, what you end up with is a promise of peace that, that actually doesn't give you peace. So the world gives you a peace, but it does not give you peace. Say that again. The world will give you a peace, but it will not give you peace. The world will give you a peace, but it will not give you peace. So what I would submit to you today is that, that the peace that the world gives is either one that it powers peace in, it, it forces it, or it ignores peace out. The world's peace is either forced or, or faked. It's either forced or faked. And here's what I mean by that. Let me explain that. If, if peace is by force, then it's by violence. So it, it's achieved by, by power and, and force. So, you know, two people or two countries, they fight and one person wins. And one person submits, other person wins, and then there's peace. Same thing, whether it's interpersonal between individuals or countries. It's the same thing. So, for example, yes, I have a black eye today. Some I mean, of you can see that. Uh, I'm, I'm training for this amateur boxing match coming up in, in February, sort of like this bucket list thing I had to do before I turn 40. I'm turning 38 this year, so I figure it's about the last year that I can do it and maybe win. So uh, I, I sparred with a guy at the gym this week who, who had about a foot... He's about a foot taller than me and about five years more experience than me, and uh, he won. He beat me up pretty good. So um, here's the thing. Uh, I, I've got a confession to make, actually, <laughs> with this guy. So um, the second round, we were fighting, and, and I started to get really frustrated because, I, you know, he had reach on me. I couldn't really get inside. Every time I did, I'd end up taking... Uh, too many hits and, and that, and I got, I just got really frustrated, and I, I already knew I had a black eye. I could see it in the, in the mirror. It was all swelling up already in the middle of the fight, and so after the second round, I, I kind of lost my temper, and I, I walked over to one of the punching bags, and I just kicked it as hard as I could, and then my coach yelled at me automatically. like, Dwight, out, sit out. I, I lost my temper. So here's what happened. After all cooled down and whatnot, the guy came over um, this guy that beat me up, and, and he said, you know, good job, man. You, you actually did really good. You got some good, good shots on me, and he gave me some, some pointers and whatnot. And then we hugged, um, and it was great. And, and, and so, um, and you know, what happened then was, then we had peace. There was peace. But, I mean, I wasn't upset anymore. It, like, we were good. I, I, I wouldn't fight the guy again, but we, there was peace because he made me submit. Like, I realized there's nothing I can do to beat this guy. He's too big and too good. Uh, I, so peace, it was accomplished through force and violence. He, he beat me into submission until we had peace. Uh, now, it's the same thing on a global scale between countries, right? Whoever kills the most people or takes the most land, they, they win when the other party is, is willing to submit and then they sign a peace treaty. Or whatever. That's, that's how it happens. So that's one kind of peace through, through force or violence where you, you make it happen. Here's the other kind of peace. Yoga. Yoga. Now, I don't mean yoga like it's a sin to do yoga. Um, doing stretches with your body is fine. What I mean is like the, the mindset behind Eastern yoga. I just said yoga to kind of get your attention. So 
Eastern worldview is to pretend, this is the Eastern way of thinking, is that suffering and conflict is not really real. So what you need to do is simply empty your, your mind of it and pretend that it doesn't exist. So get rid of the, the thoughts and the, the feelings and the emotions that are disturbing you. So you, you basically, what you end up doing is you ignore problems. You, you don't attempt to resolve them. You act as though they don't exist. And then you kind of just mystically place this word peace over top of them. Okay. So oftentimes, this is the kind of peace people are talking about when they say things like, oh, why can't we, we just all love each other? And why can't we just all get along? What they really mean is just, just ignore things and don't really have any kind of real solution. Just ignore them. Pretend that there's no problem. Fake peace, though, isn't peace at all. It's just fake peace. Uh, these are the things that Jesus is getting at when, when he's saying that the peace he gives is not like the peace that the world gives. His peace is different. The world gives peace either through force like the Roman government, or through faking it, like in the hello and goodbye greetings of the day. And neither really has the power to bring peace to the person or to the world. We can, we can say peace with our words, but it's just a cold ceremony of the mouth. Peace. So where, where are you all at on this today? Have you tried to get peace through the use of force? If you're a parent, young kids, you, you know the answer is yes, whether it's a stern word or a physical means of correction. You ever tried to get the upper hand with a person just to get what you want? Or just give it in to a person that, you know, because you didn't agree, but you just want to get along just so you could have peace? I mean, husbands and wives do this all the time, don't they? Where... You know, you're just trying to get the other person to do what you want them to do, or you just give in to make them happy, but you still really disagree. You ever ignore a problem just so that it'll go away? Try to empty your mind of it, but it just keeps coming back. It keeps coming up again and again, no matter how much yoga stretching you do. The truth is, peace and the need for peace, it's, it's not something that we can either force or ignore. In fact, the, the truth is, there's nothing we can do in and of ourselves to get it, to achieve it. If you take note of Jesus' words. It's something that he gives. It's a gift. It's a gift. There's a reason for that. So let's, let's transition and talk about what, what peace actually looks like in our third point for today, your peace. Now, with this point, what I'm talking about is, is individual peace or, or inner peace, the personal peace. Uh, the personal peace that we need and want. And, and to get at this, I think we've got to first see where the lack of peace comes from, like why we don't have peace. When, if Jesus came to give peace as the Prince of Peace, and there hasn't been peace on earth, we need to understand why. So on this question, uh, we actually have a Bible verse that very clearly addresses this, directly addresses this question. I think it gets at the heart of what's, what's going on inside of us when we don't have personal peace or, or inner peace in our, in our person. So it's from the book of James in the New Testament, James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Here's what it says. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet, and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Quarrels, fights, that sounds like lack of peace, right? We're talking about no peace here. So what is the problem? Where does, where does this verse say the lack of peace comes from? Where does this come from? Passions at war within. You see that? Passions at war within. So, so James 4 here, it, it squarely places the lack of peace inside the individual human heart. It's inside of us. You desire and not have, so you sin. See that? Coveting, it's always wanting. We want things. We don't get them, so then we have no peace. You see, it's this, this internal conflict that, that's happening inside every one of us. And, and really what's going on is it's, it's our desire, our own individual desire to be God. 
We want to be God. We want the power to get what we want when we want it. When we don't get it, we're not happy. So then we find ourselves at war with God and with others that we blame for it. And you guys see this? We, we should lay down our lives for others and love them. They're created in the image and likeness of, of God. But we can't because we're at war within ourselves. So what does Jesus, the Prince of Peace, do? What did he come to do? To lay down his life for others. To do what we can. He came to give peace, to deal with the lack of peace in us by laying down his life. Here's what Jesus says a couple chapters just before our verse in John 10. John 10, 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He laid down his life. He laid down his life literally by laying aside his glory as God, by coming to earth and being born as a little baby. We talked about that last week. And then he, he laid down his life by serving others and caring for them, attending to their physical needs, feeding them and healing them. And, and then ultimately he laid down his life for others by, by dying on the cross. And, and this is why Jesus was born, to bring peace. To bring peace by dying on the cross for his people. Make no mistake, this is really the most critical point of the sermon today, the point I, I, I want you to understand more than any others, that our lack of peace uh, with others, it, it's, it's really due to a lack of peace with God. Peace is the absence of war. When, when we're unhappy, we're at war with God. And, it, and it's rebellion and sin in our hearts. So what is... Jesus, the Prince of Peace, too, he, he comes and he lays down his life. He suffers the punishment that we deserve from God for going to war with him. And, and get this, Jesus, get, when Jesus, when they came to arrest him, Peter was there and he pulls out a sword and he's ready to fight. And Jesus, Jesus tells him, Peter, put away your sword. Put it away. Sheath the sword. Jesus, he, he refused to get peace through force. He refused. He could have. He said that. He says he has all these angels at his command with just a word. He could force peace. Could have used his divine power to do so. But instead he allowed himself to be arrested. Allowed himself to be hung up on a cross so that there could be peace in the human heart. On the cross, he, Jesus, he, he absorbs the malice of others onto himself. He takes, takes it on onto himself as if it were his own. Jesus was born so that he could die for peace. That was his mission. That was the peace that he came to bring and to give. When we embrace Jesus as our Prince of Peace, it has two effects in us. One is internal. Then we get that inner peace. That's the, that's the thing that the actual Eastern mystical pursuits are after. They're reaching for the inner peace, and we, we get it because deep down we, we realize, here's where it comes, we realize that God, he's no longer mad at us. We're no longer at war with him. His wrath is poured out on Jesus. And once we get that, then it just, it makes us want to lay down our arms before God and stop fighting. We just want to serve him with all that we are. Stop fighting and instead turn and trust him. That's the first effect is internal peace. Insofar as we are believing the gospel, embracing Jesus as our Prince of Peace, we experience that internal inner peace. And the second effect is external peace. That's peace with others. This peace with God in ourselves begins to, to pour out of us and it, and it brings us to peace with, with others, with other people. So I want to move on and talk about that in our final point for today. But, but before I do, just one simple question. Are you at war with God? Are you fighting against Him? That internal conflict and battle? I mean, honestly, are you fighting against God right now in your life? Do you sense that, that God wants you and He wants to rule and, and reign and be God over your life, but you're, you're fighting against Him? You're resisting that? God could use His force by His great power and might with violence to, to force us to bow and to bend our knee before him. But that's not the kind of bowing that, 
he's after, at least right, not right now. I mean, that will happen one day, but right now we're in a, we're in an age where, where God is attempting to get us to see how great and how good and how gracious he is toward us. That he would send his son and he would lay down his life for us and, and die for us so that we win our hearts, so that we, we, we want to bow before him. We, we bow out of changed passions and desires. We have a, a new passion and desire to, to serve him and to worship him and to love him. God's after our passion being changed. So we're not at war with him anymore. He wants our passions to be to serve him because there's no better life than serving God, having him as our God. So once again, are you fighting against God? Are you ready to lay down your arms? Do you give up the fight? Bow your knee before him and worship him? He's so worthy. He would come and take on human nature, be born as a little baby to give us peace. Get this, friends. Peace is found in having peace with God. You want peace in your life? Get right with God. Have peace with God. And that peace happens through the Prince of Peace, Jesus. Let's move on to our last point for today. Talk about this peace with others, how it plays out in our relationships, others' peace. In our passage for today, the last thing Jesus says is, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This reiterates what we've been talking about, that, that true peace is, is accomplished in the heart through Jesus dealing with the trouble and fear that we have from others. What it implies then is that there's this the possibility for trouble with others and fear of insult or injury, that, that that can become a non-issue. Trouble and fear. And what I think Jesus' reasoning here has to be that is if we have, if we have his peace inside us, in, in our hearts, with, within us, then we will be able to absorb the hurts and the wrongs that are done to us. Just as he absorbed it onto himself and when we have him, it enables us to absorb it from others. And because of that, we, have, we don't have to be afraid. There's nothing to fear. Uh, the worst thing happened to Jesus. He was crucified. But what happened three days later? He rose victorious. So the worst things can happen to us. But they won't get the best of us. They can't rob us and steal us of our peace. We can absorb hurts and wrongs done to us, and then have peace with others. Peace with others is a practical play out of having Jesus as our Prince of Peace. Understand that. It's a practical play out. You can't really be a Christian and say that you believe in Jesus and have him as a, your Prince of Peace and then be at war with others. Uh, Ken Sandy, he's uh, our keynote speaker for the Leaders Conference coming up. You heard announced at the beginning of, of the service, uh, which I encourage you all to attend. He's, Ken Sandy, he's really well known. Uh, this is the kind of book that put him on the map is uh, The Peacemaker. Uh, he wrote a great book. I've been using the biblical principles in it for, for years in pastoral counseling. And, you know, some of you, you've probably been to professional counselors at a time, or maybe some of you are going to a counselor right now. And, and, what you may have missed out on is that some counselors who don't, don't really know or understand the gospel, they, um, you know, whether they're Christian or not, the implication, they, they'll, they'll miss the heart. And what Ken Sandy does such a good job of is, is helping us see how the teaching of Jesus, Jesus as the Prince of Peace, actually helps us very practically enabling us to resolve conflicts with other people. So uh, sign up for the conference, and I know that you'll be blessed by it. Uh, we're created by God to be in relationship with him and others, and that's the theme of our, our conference is grace and gospel-filled relationships. So that's my plug for the conference. But I want to read to you from, from his book, The Peacemaker, just a little section uh, from it for us today. As as death drew near, the Lord focused on a single concept he knew to be of paramount importance for all those who would believe in him. He did not pray that his followers would always be happy, that they would never suffer, or that their rights would always be defended. Jesus prayed that his followers would get along with one another. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Peacemakers 
provide a powerful testimony to God's presence and work in our lives. When we make peace with those who have wronged us or mistreated us, others will often realize that God himself is working in and through us. So get this. If if Jesus did what he did so that we could have peace with God, then that's meant to enable us to then have peace with others. No matter what our differences or offenses may be. We can work through any of it. One more verse for today. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, and then 17 through 19 says this. He, that's Jesus. He himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we have We both have access in one spirit to the Father, so you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Peace with God. Peace with God through peace with Jesus. It begets peace with others. You see how that works? We're with others, regardless of of race, regardless of class, gender, age, whatever interest. You may be into any kind of dividing wall. It's torn down. Peace with others. Through His Spirit living in us. Jesus' peace, it actually gives us hope that we can really resolve stuff with one another. Which means that for those who follow Jesus, then we have this new responsibility. We have to work stuff out with one another. We have the gospel of Jesus so that we can have peace with God and with one another. I mean, sometimes we have to have hard conversations with one another that we don't want to have. With those that we wrong, or that those that wrong us, we, we can't ignore it. That won't bring peace. We just try and force it. That's not real peace. But with the gospel, we can actually talk through it. We can, we can absorb the hurts, and we can have resolution, and we can have true peace with one another. what Jesus did in his coming as a baby, as the Prince of Peace. This is what Jesus did in his dying for us so that we can have peace with God and peace with one another in our relationships. We must have his peace. Peace really is the, the new world order of Jesus. This is what is coming, will one day reign in all the earth. It's, it's not happening right now in our world. There's no amount of wars, no amount of mystical mumbo-jumbo will ever bring about world peace. Only the return of Jesus, only Him ruling in our hearts and in our lives. And when Jesus returns, there will be peace in full. So there's there's a future aspect to this, this peace. Right now we live in this age and time of the gospel where God means for us to work, to to bring about peace in in our hearts and peace with one another. But one day, the day will come when the opportunity for Jesus' peace will end and all those who've rejected Him will be rejected. Our job for, for those of us now who have embraced Him as the Prince of Peace is to spread that peace. That's why Romans 10, 15 says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, which Ephesians 6 says that our, our feet are fitted with the gospel of peace. We're to spread peace. We're to be ambassadors of peace. And that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean uh, just fighting for social justice. It may include that, but only insofar as it points to the peace that Jesus brings to sinners who have been at war with God. God wants us to work for Jesus' peace in the human heart. So, on that note, is there somebody that you need to get some peace with. You know, someone that you need to make peace with because you say you're a Christian and you love and believe in the Prince of Peace. Someone that maybe you're still mad at or angry with or you know is angry with you. You need to work it out. But as far as possible, we're to live at peace with one another. Some of you today, after the sermon or later in the day, maybe there's somebody you need to get with and just say, I'm sorry. You need to work it out. Maybe there's something you just need to absorb because Jesus has absorbed a lot from you. Some of you might have some, some tough moments ahead of you this week with Christmas coming, Christmas celebrations, family drama, right? 
Be ambassadors of peace, Resolve Church. Give peace to your family this Christmas. Give them the Prince of Peace. Oh, how we need the Prince of Peace. May he work in us and among us and through us. We need him. Let's be peacemakers. The band's going to play a couple more songs and we'll respond by, by coming and receiving the supper of the Lord Jesus as we do here each week at our church. Jesus' body and his blood and the bread and the wine. This table that we come to each week, it's a, it's a table of peace. It, it tells us that Jesus has broken down the dividing wall. Any barrier between us and God and with others, Jesus has made peace for by dying on the cross. Jesus' peace. Do you need the Prince of Peace today? World peace? You've been, been looking for, for peace and by trying to force it or just fake it and ignore it? Your peace? That inner peace you're longing for? It's in Jesus Others' peace, having peace with others, it comes through Jesus. Now, the truth is that a lot of us have kind of, we can easily put our, our hope in world peace. We can try and put our hope in just having some sort of mystical peace inside us. We can try and put our hope in, in just a relationship and but none of it actually brings peace. Only Jesus can, can give us peace. It's found in him and him alone as the Prince of Peace. Jesus was born to give us peace. He is our Prince of Peace. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for coming. God, thank you for coming so that we could have peace with God. Thank you for your grace, you are good, you are kind. May we live at peace with one another. Give us your peace, we pray. In Jesus' good name, amen.